It's a high tech conversation on the low tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Okay, so uh, w- welcome everybody to this week's Bench Talk 101. Um, I, I, when I started this, it was all about COVID and all about you know bringing people together to, to talk. And I, I never imagined. Um, what it would end up with, and and what I mean by that is that you know I, I was thinking it was a few of us from from uh, from England, you know, getting together to just to talk about you know old times and talk about the woodworking shows and share experience. And um, what what's actually happened is uh, it's gone absolutely global. You know, I've made a little list. Um, you know, we've had people in from Spain, Finland, Sweden, Italy, America, Canada, Germany, Austria, Belgium, Australia, Portugal, UK. And, and, and now um, Brazil, and, and that leads us nicely on to, to tonight's speaker, which is um, Thiago. And uh, I kind of put Thiago on the spot last week, um, and people would have seen it maybe in the chat because we ended up doing it in the public chat rather than the private chat. Uh, but, but luckily, Thiago said yes. And uh, it's been quite interesting because um, I first sort of heard about Thiago, um, I don't know, maybe it was back in March, April time, and he was doing an interview with um, Chris Swartz and I thought you know who's this guy who's got Chris Swartz on on his own show um, and they're talking for over an hour and, and it was just kind of crazy stuff so um, I, I thought uh, you know this this is fantastic and week on week he's been with us here on on the uh, bench talk he, he missed a couple of weeks but uh, he's back on again now um, and, and literally for me it's like well what what is woodwork in Brazil you know how, how does it work you know is it the same as what we've got over here and and I sort of chucked a few things at him. I said, you know, do you want to talk about sustainability? Do you want to talk about the different types of wood in, in Brazil? Um, and and he, he kindly said yes. So, um, Thiago, I'm going to ask you to uh, present to us tonight and, and tell us all about Brazil and tell us about what, what you get up to in woodwork in Brazil. So, uh, Thiago, over to you. Okay, Jeffrey, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. I hope, I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is like the new hello, it's, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> so, um, yes, thank you so much for uh, inviting me, uh, Jeffrey. I, I have been uh, uh, joining uh, these meetings and I think they're, they're just fantastic. It's, it's a joy to be connected to uh, woodworkers all over the world and, and uh, so many people I respect and, and I do uh, learn a lot from you uh, from some of you in person, I, I, I don't see Derek here, but uh, I, I took a class with Derek Jones in, in Kentucky. That's uh, where we met and that's where I met Chris. Uh, we were there uh, last year when the borders were open uh, to Brazilians. So uh, it's, it's uh, again, uh, an honor to be here among you and uh, I'm so happy to um, join in with some uh, insights and some of my experience on what is uh, to be uh, living and working here in Brazil. I'm, I, I am a native Brazilian. And uh, so I, I was thinking uh, maybe at first I, I should, uh, uh, I could uh, steal some two or three minute, minutes from my uh, presentation to introduce myself. And then uh, Jeffrey suggested that I, I should uh, 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 approach this uh, matter of sustainability which I think is a, a very important one. It is a concern for us, but some of the things we face uh, in a uh, developing country, I shouldn't say developing because we're not, but uh, uh, you know, from a, uh, someone in this part of the world, the issues may not be uh, really the, the same that, uh, that you face. So, um, okay, my name is Thiago. I do have a, a shop here in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a, the biggest city in, in, um, in South America. We are now like 12 million people living in the city. It's, it's a bit of a uh, madness. Um, and um, before becoming a woodworker, I was a clinical psychologist. So I have a major in psychology. I did work with patients for, for some time and um, doing woodwork uh, was a, a side thing, was a hobby. And then uh, I, I was uh, working as a psychologist. I was researching the history of psychoanalysis. And then I realized that making things with my own hands and uh, working wood was something that uh, had more to do with me, with who I am. So I, um, 
I gravitated towards woodworking and I just abandoned uh, psychology. I was living in Argentina back then. And, um, and then when I came back to Brazil and when I decided to become a crafts, uh, craftsman, I went into organ building. Uh, so I, I do love musical instruments. I first started uh, working wood, making electric guitars. I had a friend who was a luthier and he uh, taught me how to use the machines, uh, but I couldn't find no one that could uh, show me how to use hand tools. That was, uh, you know, uh, the training, formal training is, is uh, not available here. Um, so I learned to use machines. I built a few, a few guitars and then I went into organ building and, and harpsichord making. So I went from the, uh, the, the, uh, those uh, stringed instruments to the keyboard instruments and, and historical keyboard instruments. And, and, and because of this uh, 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 experience, I was able to work with uh, people from uh, France and Spain and Germany that were doing restorations. They had uh, uh, restoration work going on in Brazil. And that's when I was able to get uh, uh, or to learn firsthand how to sharpen, how to cut joinery um, and how to use, really use hand tools. From that, uh, I uh, just uh, later, I, I started teaching because uh, people here was, was, were asking me to uh, um, share what I had learned. And I come from a family of teachers, so teaching is somewhat in my uh, blood, let's put it that way. And then uh, uh, I started teaching kids as well. So coming from, uh, you know, organ building and uh, doing hand tool woodworking, those things are not very uh, easy to find here and are, in a way, dying trades, at least, at least in this part of, of the world. So. I thought that uh, I could do, uh, uh, it, it, was, it was a good idea to um, to teach and teach uh, kids that they can work with their hands. There's a lot to be learned when you engage in activities uh, just like that. And there's a lot that you can learn about uh, what we learn in school. Uh, there's a lot of science, there's a lot of uh, math, a lot of, you know, how to, how to use your body in woodworking. So then I became a, a teacher and teaching was my main uh, activity until the pandemic uh, hit. Um, then I, 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 I ran back to my shop and I started making furniture again and accepting commissions. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I do. I have a, a, um, a project here, uh, it's an initiative called uh, Saber Com As Mãos, uh, which translates to knowing by hand. Uh, and that is, a, it, it's pretty much an educational uh, um, uh, initiative. So uh, we try to uh, study, uh, research and, and promote traditional crafts uh, here in Brazil. And we try to uh, value the people that uh, dedicate themselves uh, to these activities and we try to uh, uh, promote them. So, um, okay, that's, that's enough for, uh, enough about me. So I'm in Sao Paulo, I'm in Brazil. Brazil is a fairly large uh, country. Uh, let me, let me channel my, my inner uh, um, Michael Paling right now. So let me tell you something about Brazil. So uh, we are, uh, the, the country is as big as uh, US if you count the uh, contiguous 50 uh, states. Uh, so Brazil, it's, it's the fourth or fifth biggest country in the world. Uh, I think the eighth economy in the world. So not a poor country per se, but a very um, uh, unequal country. It's, inequality is still a big issue here. Um, we were um, discovered, invented, invaded, you can pick one, uh, by Portugal in, uh, in the year 1500. So that's uh, when uh, Portugal first got here. 
And Brazil had a different name. Brazil was called at first Terra de Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz land. And uh, because of the first economic cycle, I think maybe, maybe that's a stretch, but uh, the first economic cycle here uh, was the, the trade of a wood. So Brazil got its name from a wood. I don't know of any other country, uh, please help me out if, if you know it, but um, uh, Brazil was named after a wood, which is this one right here. I hope you, I hope you can see it. This is the famous Pau Brasil. Pau Brasil is also known as Brazil wood or Pernambuco. Pernambuco is a state in the uh, north, uh, well, northeastern part of Brazil. Uh, that's where most of the uh, uh, Pau Brasil was first found. And uh, it was, um, uh, the, they, they soon found out that this, this wood could produce a dye and a, a red dye. It's orange or orangey in color. And when you cut it, it's, it's bright orange. So uh, it looks like the amber. Uh, you know, when you burn wood, you have that uh, very bright color uh, that, that, that it's called amber, right? Um, so uh, because of that, that the, the name of that is Braza in Portuguese. So uh, one theory says that the, 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 the naming for the wood and for the, the country came from that. Um, so this was um, uh, traded as a, a material for, uh, uh, for making dyes and it was uh, exported to Europe. And if you mix uh, the dust of this wood with uh, some um, alkalis, is that a, uh, how you say it? You can produce that dye, that rich uh, red uh, colored dye. So oddly enough, a country that, 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 that was named after a wood, uh, this wood was not used uh, as timber, it, it was used as a dye. As you will see, uh, there is no, uh, there was no big industry or, or commercial uh, use of wood uh, during the colony and, and, and even later on, which is pretty odd if you consider that we have some very uh, special trees and, and, and wood species in, in this uh, part of the world. Let me show you some, just uh, uh, Jeffrey asked me to, to, to do this. So I hope you can see this. This is Brazilian rosewood, a very uh, uh, um, much loved kind of wood. Um, uh, lovely for, for guitar making. This is uh, very good for guitar making, has a very rich tone and a very rich color, very nice smell. It is a uh, um, uh, wonderful wood. You, can't, you, you cannot, cannot find this wood anymore. It was, it is, it was pretty much extinct. So that's, that leads us to uh, one of the problems I'll, I'll address in a moment. So we have bloodwood, bloodwood grows here. Uh, uh, it's this rich uh, red blooded uh, uh, color. And most of the woods we do use here are hardwoods. Um, so we have purple heart, and I'm not, I'm not sure if Tranek is over there, but I have in here a purple heart jointer to show it to, yeah, I, I think he will, he will love this, not for sale, but uh, this is uh, something I also make, I'm a plane maker and I make these uh, um, Krenov styles uh, planes and I, um, I teach how to make planes as well. That's what I, I like the most. Uh, but uh, so some of the woods we do use here are um, some that you, you know, mahogany is a native Brazilian wood. Um, what else? So purple heart, you do, you do find in, in Europe and the US. Uh, you probably heard of jatoba, which is actually uh, called jatoba. Uh, that's uh, exported to the US, I, I know of it. It, it. it is sometime called Brazilian cherry has nothing to do with cherry, but um, I, I can show you the fruit of this wood uh, later. It's 
right over there. So, uh, and we also use uh, Frejot, Palmarfin, some, uh, some of these uh, you won't know, but I'll, I can show you later if you want to. Um, we also have Spanish cedar, which is not Spanish, but uh, it grows in here and we use it quite a, uh, quite a bit. So, um, this country that was, um, you know, a Portugal, a colony of Portugal for many, many years uh, from 1500 until uh, 1808. Uh, in 1808, Napoleon was, uh, you know, in, uh, got into Portugal and then the, the king of Portugal fled and, and, and came to Brazil. So he transferred the, uh, uh, the crown to Brazil and then Brazil was still a colony uh, until 1822, when it became an empire, and the emperor was the king's son. So uh, it, it's this this story is uh, uh, repeats itself quite a bit, quite a bit, because uh, it is uh, we have a lot of consensus uh, and, and consensual, uh, you know, arrangements going on, and not much of a. a, a, a you know, revolutions. So Brazil became independent through those uh, arrangements. And we still have those same families uh, sort of ruling the country. But uh, going back to uh, wood and woodwork, um, we have so uh, uh, this history of when, when Portugal got here, they, they didn't have a, a very clear notion on what to do with this land. So uh, colonization was a was an ongoing process and they were, you know, making their minds as they went. And um, so what we have and what they did uh, from the moment, from, from, you know, the first moment on was, was uh, uh, some sort of ex extractivism. So uh, pillage. So they was they were taking away everything they could with no good planning, and that involves the the woods as well. Because uh, when the crown, when the Portuguese crown realized that they could um, that 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 was a very uh, important um, asset, it was, it was a very important uh, um, thing, uh, you know, wood. They uh, made this uh, law that. Uh, said that all the good wood in the country belonged to the crown. And what happened because of that was that uh, it, the wood that the crown didn't exploit it or, or harvest or annihilate, annihilate uh, oh, how do you say that, uh, annihilation? Yeah, when you're, you're not carefully harvesting the wood, but you're, you're just taking everything away and not managing the land. So when they, they couldn't do that, the, 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 they also didn't allow the, the, the landowners to do that. So we have a lot of deforestation going uh, along because of, uh, well, people were just burning the, the forest down from the colony. I thought that uh, this style of uh, slash and burn farming was something new. And I was very surprised to know that this, is, this has been going on since um, 16th and 17th century. Um, so you have that, and, and, uh, um, which, is, which is, is, is a big, uh, um, a big issue for uh, deforestation here in Brazil. Deforestation is not coming from the exploitation of timber primarily. And that has been the truth since the colony. So we have uh, those fires uh, coming along and then you have uh, agriculture and, and uh, making land uh, for livestock. Uh, uh, as causes of deforestation. That is still today the number one cause for deforestation. It's, uh, it's livestock, they're moving the, uh, uh, um, uh, the cows, you know, everywhere and they taking down the forest. What is new is that um, uh, we have right now uh, in the government people that are pushing forward. So uh, for that kind of thing. So mining activities in the Amazon and uh, uh, the cultivation of soy and, uh, you know, 
all those uh, products and, and also livestock in, in the uh, uh, once preserved forest. That's, that's, uh, that is an, an ongoing problem, problem uh, here. Uh, I can I can uh, just uh, name a few books if you, if you want to you know dig down. I'm sorry for the mining uh, metaphor here, but uh, if you want to go on further and, and and find out more about this history, I'm not going to bore you to death here with this. But I thought it was important to address this, these these issues, so it was uh, you know clear. Uh, um, what is our reality? But if you if you want to find out, there's a there's an author uh, called uh, uh, called Sean Miller. He wrote Fruitless Trees, and fruitless fruitless uh, comes from 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 that notion that uh, 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 even the crown, the Portuguese crown, was not making any profit from the timber exploitation here. Um, fruitless trees. I, I, I forgot the, the. There's a subtitle, but uh, if you look for Sean Miller, you, you, you will find this uh, this book. And there's another one um, that is a bit older, but also good. Uh, it, it's called "With Broadax and Firebrand" by Warren Dean. So both those books address these uh, issues. Going back to Brazilian culture and, uh, you know, what happened here in Brazil is uh, when, so we were a colony and uh, soon Portugal was, you know, started bringing um, uh, Africans uh, to this land as uh, slaves. And before Portugal even got here, we had uh, people living in this uh, area, uh, in this country, let's say. Um, and uh, we, we have uh, around 300 different groups, ethnical groups, uh, native, uh, native, native Brazilians, um, indigenous groups uh, living in this, uh, in this land with almost uh, with around 250 different languages. So, Brazil uh, human presence was, uh, you know, is, is, is really old here and uh, it's, it's also very, very rich, but we have people uh, scattered around the country and with a, uh, with different, a, a, a different, uh, um, how can I call it? Uh, what, 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 what Portugal found here was a bit different than what uh, existed in Mexico or, or Peru. Um, so in those places, you had a, a, a sort of organization that was pretty much city-like, nation-like, uh, and you had a confrontation, and then those uh, indigenous people were defeated by, uh, by the Europeans, but you have a, a sort of a, a memory of what was in there, what was there before. In Brazil, this is all scatter, scatter, uh, and, and 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 more difficult to perceive sometimes. So, being a plural uh, place with many many different scattered traditions uh, is one characteristic uh, of this country. So, uh, Jeffrey asked me to talk about sustainability. Since I'm no expert, I found that very uh, a very hard task. And then I moved from a hard task to an impossible one, which is to define Brazil. <laughs> but uh, so just bear with me here just for, for two more minutes. Um, we have that when, when, when we start uh, working on a trade or you know making any stuff, um, you can sometimes uh, face one of those really, really old traditions if you do some uh, archaeology, uh, and we also find uh, you will also find uh, European traditions uh, from Portugal, uh, obviously, but then from England and the U.S. and Italy and and Japan in the 19th uh, century. There was a uh, a big uh, there was a huge immigration from. Uh, uh, Italy and, and from Japan. This is Sao Paulo is the place where, where, where most uh, um, uh, the, the, the bigger the bigger number of Japanese Japanese people living outside Japan. So we are also presented to that 
but not in a very organized, systematic way. So the way I, I learned how to work wood was by those, was bumping into those things out of curiosity or just uh, luck or, you know, just uh, by meeting people. And um, so I didn't have a formal training. And uh, I learned, as I said, with Europeans that were here and then trying to find those old masters, unknown masters that we have here that have learned uh, uh, from, I don't know who, but they are still around, but you, 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 it is sometimes hard to spot uh, these uh, folks. I assume or I imagine it is a bit different than what you will find in, in the US and in, 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 uh, in Europe, perhaps. Uh, uh, so let me move on and uh, um, by saying that um, woodworking today in Brazil is pretty much um, or has to do with a different kind of material than solid wood. Uh, what you will find most is uh, MDF and um, also plywood and melamine, those kind of materials. So there's that, that's what's hegemonic today. And uh, with that, since you have different processes and the places that train people, the schools that you, that you can attend to, um, they are, um, they have been captured by the industry. So the industry tells uh, what these uh, schools should teach. So if you need someone to operate CNC and glue melamine, but not cut joinery, you won't be able to, to learn that in a, uh, in, in a uh, school. So uh, what, we, what we find today is uh, in woodworking is a few uh, craftspeople working with solid wood and in some other areas of, of the country, you'll still find people working with solid wood. But uh, most of the, uh, what you will find here is uh, with, uh, is, is on MDF and, and, and plywood or that kind of thing. Um, another uh, interesting aspect of uh, woodworking here is that since we had slavery until well, officially until 1888, that's when the, there was a law that uh, uh, prohibited uh, slavery. But since we had uh, slavery for so long, all uh, everything that was manual labor was carried on by slaves. So the forming of, of a, the uh, forming of a class of workers uh, with guilds, uh, is, as as uh, like the ones you have in Europe and the U.S. is uh, is sort of missing here. We, we do find some um, corporations, as we call it, in in, in some urban centers, but um, we we don't have the same. It's it's not the same. It's 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 it, 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 it's just not the same thing as as what you have in you know elsewhere. And um, because of that, the place, I, I, I'm, the social place for manual labor is even uh, worse here than it is in, you know, in, in other places. So that's one of the goals uh, uh, for Saber Quas Mons, knowing by hand, to uh, try to address that issue. Um, so uh, that sort of, um, 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 uh, please excuse me for my uh, uh, sort of tormented uh, travel through uh, history and, and to my perceptions as a crafts, uh, craftsman here, uh, working wood here in Brazil. But uh, all of that sort of uh, make up what is, or, or the, uh, what is my world here in Brazil. Um, I was uh, talking to Jeffrey that, uh, you know, maybe we could, I, I could shorten my presentation and, and leave more time to uh, talking. So I think that's, it's, it's, we have reached, uh, you know, a good uh, point here. Um, and, 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 and I, well, I thank you very much. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your comments and your, your questions if you have any. Thank you.
Brilliant. Lo lovely. Thank, thank you very much, Thiago. And it's so good to hear about the history of your country um, and also seeing a few types of the wood that uh, we, we all crave for because, you know, we don't really have so much of that over here. You know, we, we're used to a bit of oak, a bit of ash and, and things like that. So your, 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 your native woods are our are, are dreams, you know, when we talk about rosewoods and babinga and things like that. So it's really, really quite uh, interesting for us. Um, and it's interesting how you say about, you know, the schools, um, you know, going into the, the modern methods of, uh, you know, MDF and, and uh, you know, uh, melamine boards and things like that. So, you know, when you've got such a wealth of resource um, on your doorstep, um, I mean, obviously, these are engineered boards um, and therefore engineered, you know, they're engineered for a reason. It's not just about the, um, the fact that, you know, you can get more out of a tree or something. It's, it's engineered for the properties of the materials to do better for, for work. So, you know, the advancements are quite, you know, incredible of where, where we've come from. So, uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much. And, and uh, you know, great, great talk there. So, yeah, j j just quick uh, comment. Um, it is, it is, uh, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have words for it. So uh, it, it, it is uh, interesting to find uh, that reality because uh, engineer boards are sold as something, you know, that are good for the environment because you have, you can manage a forest, but we have decided to use um, exotics for uh, uh, that product in Brazil. So you're not using native wood for those uh, in those projects and they are mono uh, monocultures. So you're, you're, you're destroying native forests to uh, make a plantation for pines. And then the pine has to be uh, carried out from where they, they are harvested to the factory, uh, you know, in trucks using diesel and so fossil fuels. So there's nothing uh, sustainable, you know, regarding those, those materials. And what is what I try to address or just, you know, make a, a quick comment was is, it is it is interesting how we don't really have a good uh, industry. We, we didn't really made a good wood industry, you know, in Brazil using our wood. So what is taken away? It has been uh, ex exploited, but uh, uh, not in a, uh, a way that would be good for Brazilians. Yeah, yeah, which is a, a real shame, isn't it? A real shame. Look, I mean, you've got absolutely tons of questions coming through, so let, let's let's kick off with the questions. Um, R Richard Arnold, um, up first. Uh, I need to let you unmute yourselves. So, R Richard, over to you. Okay, thank you, Thiago. That was really interesting. Um, as a joiner, I'm sort of interested. You're talking about your own native timbers and what have you. What does the general building trade in Brazil use as a general structural timber? Do you use any native woods, or is that imported? Uh, thanks, Richard. Thanks for the the, the question. Uh, uh, we don't usually build with wood much. Uh, we did that. We, we, we did that some uh, at some point, uh, and we used uh, imbuya, or uh, which is this one. This plane is made out of imbuya, uh, and uh, araucaria, which is uh, actually the only uh, conifer we have that it's used for furniture, and it's this one right here. And uh, in some areas of the country, in some parts of the, parts of the country, you still build with wood but uh, we use uh, mostly uh, concrete uh, and, and cinder blocks and bricks to build um, so we're not really building building houses uh, we use the wood to build uh, uh, furniture and the most uh, the woods that's that's also you know local but but also not because Sao Paulo, my, my state, is the biggest consumer of uh, Amazonian wood in the country. So, you know, lots of uh, trees are fell down over there and, and cut here or cut over there and shipped uh, this way. So the most common woods used in, in uh, furniture making here in Brazil are I'm just going to name a few, and then if, 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 if you need more information, I'll, I'll be happy to 
to send you pictures or you know uh, anything else you need. Uh, so Tawari is, it has been used, cedro, which is Spanish cedar. Uh, mahogany is, is impossible to find. It has been, uh, you know, it is forbidden right now. Uh, so we don't have it. We use marfim, palm marfim, and um, uh, what else? Frejot, jequitiba, uh, which is uh, this one. We use uh, cacheta. Most of these that I just named come from the Amazon. Right. Um, I mean, I've in, in the past, a uh, number of years ago, we used to use what we used to call cedarella, which I think was Brazilian cedar, but it was plantation grown in, in Africa, actually. But it, it, we found that to be quite durable um, as, a, as a timber to use for joinery, although it was a little bit soft. But uh, So I am familiar with that, which I think is pretty much the same as your Brazilian cedar, yeah. Um, it is. I think it's the same one. The botanical name for uh, cedro, we call it cedro rosa. Here. Yeah. Uh, it's cedrella odorata or cedrella ficilis. There are two different species that are very similar. Yeah. It is rather soft, has a very uh, pungent smell, bitter. Yeah. You, you got that in your in your lips later in yeah, it, hours. It's quite bitter, yes. Yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah, I use it. We still can uh, find it and we use it. Uh, it is, it is native. I, I think it's called Spanish cedar because you can make, uh, it is a fantastic wood for uh, uh, necks, guitar necks, acoustic, yeah. acoustic guitar necks. Yeah. And yeah. since it has been used in Spanish guitars, um, so uh, both mahogany and, and that kind of cedar. Uh, yeah. has nothing to do with uh, what what uh, some people call cedar, which is a conifer. This is a hardwood. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, fantastic timber. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Matthias, over to you. Yes, I've got a bit of a problem here because Richard, Richard stole my question, more or less. <laughs> I was going to ask something similar because I was, I, I was thinking during your talk here that where I come from originally, if you go down to the timber merchants, what you're going to see piles and piles and piles and piles of is going to be pine and spruce. That, that, that is going to be your go-to wood for, for anything, anything basic, anything uh, quick and dirty or anything every day, uh, or anything that is going to be painted. So, so things where, as it were, the beautiful qualities of many of the exotic woods or of our own hardwoods didn't matter. And while I understand that, because you just told us that these days you hardly construct with wood or, or there's very comparatively little, shall we say, everyday use of wood in Brazil. There must have been a time when you did build with wood and when you also made your furniture out of wood and did, was there sort of a go-to timber that was not one of your, uh, the, the famous exotics, one of the, the, the woods which Brazil is, is, is more famous, something that you just, was too uninteresting to export, so you just, you, you just kept it for yourselves, or did you actually work mainly with, with what you've already talked about, the, the, uh, the proper exotics, what we call exotics? Yeah, native to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly, uh, precisely. Uh, go to... I'm yeah. sorry, yeah, go, go on. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, obviously when I was saying exotics, uh, no derogatory sense was implied. It was- No, no. It was, uh, I was talking from my perspective. Sure, sure, no, no, I got, I got it. Uh, uh, so uh, the go-to wood that depends on where you are. So mm. in here in the, um, I'm in the Southeast part of Brazil. So uh, there's a word that is maybe not that well known. Although Krenov, I think James Krenov made something out of this wood. It just, it, it's called peroba, peroba hosen. Okay. And uh, peroba has been used to build uh, uh, um, houses and this flooring. And uh, so in Sao Paulo and, and Paraná, which is a, uh, the state below Sao Paulo, um, so peroba in Buya Araucaria, which is the Brazilian pine, uh, those have been used in construction, and that's what people could find. In the uh, in, in the Amazon, you have floating houses, and sometimes, and you need to use 
wood that would uh, float and that would be resistant to uh, rot and uh, um, and those uh, wood borers. Uh, so there's one called uh, oh my god, what is it? Asaku, I think. Yeah. So, but that, that would be you know locally you would have go to yeah. timbers used mm -hmm. in building and in furniture um i can only or i, I didn't I, I didn't research this uh, you know uh, deeply enough but i can talk about my own uh, perspective i can find uh, a lot of amazonian woods in here so uh, because of that trade since there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> construction going on well we have in carpentry the, the use that we uh, 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 for us in carpentry is not very noble because we're building with cinder blocks and, and concrete yeah. and so uh, uh, what a carpenter does in, uh, in in construction has to do with making molds you know yeah. for uh, concrete yeah. or my, making my, my, my father-in-law did that for a living mm, okay he, he, yeah. he, he was a construction carpenter and built uh, spent most of his life building uh, forms for concrete to be poured into. Sure, so most, you know, noble woods are sometimes used for that. And uh, so there, there has been a study to use lesser or, you know, wood mm. that could be e more easily managed because that's, that's an issue. So uh, if we have, it, it grows on trees, you know, it's not possible that we run out of wood, but it is if we have, if, if, if you're greedy and if you don't care about the environment, and if you don't care if there's, you know, fires consuming uh, several biomes in the country and, you know, and you pull over the firemen uh, fighting, uh, fighting those fires. So, yeah. <laughs> I can wait to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. There's a message in the chat from uh, Douglas Lambert that's talking about that, that they, uh, there used to be some use of the paroba in the South States. I, I'm presuming he means a... Uh, America or maybe uh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, the, 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 it's Paraná and, and it's also São Paulo, but Paraná and uh, also you know below that Santa Catarina and, and Rio Grande do Sul. Douglas is, is a fellow uh, woodworker here from Brazil. Ah, oh, okay, sorry. So the South yeah. States of Brazil, you're talking about? Sure. Okay, um, Paul, over to you. Hi, Thiago. Thanks for the talk. It's been really interesting. What do you actually use for sort of windows and doors? Because over here, it's mostly UPVC nowadays. Hmm. Uh, well, great, great question. Uh, also depends on where you are. Peroba has been used. Uh, we also have uh, Garapeta, been used very hard, dense wood. It's yellowish. I'll, I'll, I'll grab a, one to show you in a moment. Um, and uh, what else do we use? Cambará, uh, yeah. So uh, Cedrinho, which is not the same as cedar, the, the Spanish cedar, it's a different one. But with, with common names, you have that. It's, it's really not the same wood, but it, it is similar or people will try to push you this other species and they, they call it the same. So Cedrinho, uh, Cedrinho would be the diminutive form of Cedro in Portuguese. Uh, but has really nothing to do. It is used to make um, that kind of things. Yes, um, we are. We, we we do have PVC and uh, other uh, other materials as well because um, those uh, termites can be a big big problem here. So you you're either. Uh, you know, buying wood that has been treated or you're just applying some sort of uh, chemical uh, to it yourself, or uh, you just uh, agree to change, you know, everything, you know, the, every 10 or 15 years, or you use a, a, other materials. Um, there is a couple of, of, of species that are really impervious to termites, but they are not that common. So that must be difficult for your wood store then, if termites are a problem. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Okay, uh, Chester, over to you. Ah, thank you. Uh, Thiago, thank you for a, a really great talk. It was very Thanks. nice. It was very nice. I, I had a couple of little questions earlier in your talk. Um, uh, f first, and I think you might have answered it. Um, 
because of the invasion by Portugal, I wondered uh, prior to, to Portuguese, what was the native language? But you explained that there were so many groups that maybe there wasn't one in particular, a native language, uh, that it didn't derive from Spanish or, or Latin or, you know, so I wondered about that. And um, so maybe you could mention that. And then uh, I wonder, do you have Granadillo down there? Do you, are you familiar with that wood? Um, my family's from Colombia. And so we use a lot of, uh, of mahogany in Colombia. And, uh, but it's fascinating that Brazil, South America, going up into uh, Mexico, Belize, Belize has a lot of banac and other woods. It's fascinating the change of those woods between the Southern point and coming up. And my last thing, and I'll let you talk, is when you said you went back to taking commissions, you didn't say for what, whether it was furniture, planes, or guitars. So language, <laughs> wood, and, and your commissions. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll answer in that order. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chester. Uh, so uh, yeah, there, was, there were many languages, there still are, you know, this, these uh, uh, folks have been massacred and, 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 and then some uh, way exterminated, but a, a few, uh, but the, there, there are still, you know, some that are uh, um, still living and they do preserve their uh, culture and language. Um, what I didn't say, and that was just because I was really nervous, is that uh, one thing uh, very interesting about Brazil is that you have a, a mix, or uh, you know, of of, of everything. So some uh, 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 indigenous people were uh, assimilated. Is that a word? Um, so or they mixed, you know, into and, and, and that makes what we have, uh, what we know as, as Brazil and, and Brazilians. So um, that said, uh, the main, so we had many, many languages and you have some different uh, branches. Tupi and Tupi Guarani was the main branch. So you have some different languages that would fit in there. And sometimes, you know, different people, they could communicate, uh, although they had different languages or maybe dialects, I'm not so sure, they would be able to understand each other, but they had like essentially different languages, but they would belong to the uh, uh, same uh, 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 linguistic branch. Tupi is, is, is the main one. We have different ones. Uh, and, uh, another one is uh, G, I think it's called G. Um, and uh, yeah, we have many, many others. Um, but in the, uh, the coastline, we have main, mainly Tupi being spoken. And we do, f we do sense that because some of the uh, uh, woods we have here are still called by the, uh, those names, the Tupi names. So uh, you had uh, the Muira or Mbira was the uh, 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 Tupi name for uh, tree. And uh, Piranga uh, is, is the, uh, Pirang is uh, red. So the uh, Pau Brasil, the Brazil wood was called uh, Ibirapitanga or Ibirapiranga, depending on the, uh, you know, uh, how you would um, turn those names into Portuguese. Um, so yeah, we, we, we can sense that uh, presence today. Um, and those are the languages. Um, woods, what was, what was the question about woods? Which is, I just thought it was fascinating, whether or not you had Grenadillo. Oh yes, no. Uh, I'm That's not further so north maybe. Mm, yes, yeah. We do have, uh, no, but Brauna would be something else. We have Brauna, Brauna is a very dark wood. It looks like ebony, just like Grenadillo can look. Uh, but um, no, I have worked Grenadillo when I was working with this uh, German lady that built harpsichords, but she bought Grenadillo in, in Germany. Um, oh. So it doesn't grow in here. It's not known by that name. Maybe it, we have something similar, but it's it may be not commercial, or maybe it's just just doesn't grow in here. I'm not, Maybe I'm not further sure. north towards the equator. Could um, be, yeah. Some so would. I was. I was struck by. I was talking to Scott Landis the other day, and uh, you may know him because of the uh, the, the workbench book. 
he published uh, many years ago, and he's a head of a foundation called uh, uh, Greenwood Global. Um, and uh, he was uh, he he wrote an article for uh, I think Fine Woodworking in the eighties uh, or maybe early nineties about uh, the work that they were doing in Peru, teaching green woodworking. So I, I haven't say this, said this, but. Uh, uh, um, I think that one way to promote sustainability here would be to try to work with local woods. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm trying to promote green woodworking and using urban uh, wood uh, from trimmings or, you know, wood that just uh, uh, fall. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, and, uh, yeah. And um, so he, he was. He was. Uh, he he sent me a list of wood that they they would find in Peru, and uh, many are uh, woods I do know. So he had. Uh, uh, it, it's called cachimbo, cachimbo in Peru, because you have part of the Amazon going into Peru, and you have like in Iquitos and that part of Peru. Um, you have the, the Peruvian Amazon, and uh, we do have the same species. They, they have different names, but pretty much different, uh, the, the same properties. Uh, sometimes we have the same species, but since they grow, they are grown in different areas, they are very different. But in this case, uh, it seemed to me by the descriptions that Cachimbo is pretty much like the Jequichiba. Uh, we have in here, and he had like also the um, what is it called? The uh, Amara, Simaruba, Simaruba Amara is the botanical name. We call it um, Caixeta in Portuguese, which is this whitish wood, very soft, easy to work with, and people make boxes out of this box in Portuguese. Is Portuguese is called uh, caixa, so caixeta is the wood for boxes. <laughs> so and the I, is what you made. What what were you? What commissions were you taking? Furniture. furniture. Yeah, right now furniture. I do. I am restoring a mandolin, a, a, a Neapolitan mandolin, mandolin, the one with the uh, the the the, the lute, the lute like uh, uh, um, um, sound box. Or, you know the. Um, looks like a belly. So <laughs> I'm restoring one, but uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty much making furniture and, and hand planes. This is a commission. This is going out the door in a moment. <laughs> It'd be nice maybe uh, sometime uh, you can show us some of the pictures of your furniture that you make, but not, uh, I, I know the topic's different, but thank you, Thiago, for your presentation. Very nice. Very thank nice. you so much, Chester, yeah. Brilliant, thank you, Chester. Thank you, uh, Thiago. Um, next up is uh, Josh. Hey, Diago, good to see you again. Hey, Josh. Uh, so enjoy the talk. I'm glad the previous question uh, got you to mention Greenwood Global, because that's what I started thinking about. This, this I, Well, you, you know this already, but I, I'm an economist. And so this idea that they have of helping people use the local resources and kind of giving them an incentive to invest in the forest seems it's, it's such a, you know, to my mind, a brilliant way forward. Uh, but it's it's clear that that's or it seems like that's not happening in Brazil, uh, and, and especially once you mentioned the size comparison to the U.S. Uh, I started you know, you didn't uh, I don't think go to the central you, you didn't go uh, west of the Mississippi when you were here, uh, where there are just expanses of nothing, like just nothing other than corn and wheat and soybeans, and so like the idea that you're in Brazil they're taking down trees that are worth so much to grow soybeans, which could be grown in places that are worth, you know, where there's nothing growing else. Yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy. So I was wondering what institutions still exist that might be getting in the way of moving Brazil's economy kind of away from soybean farming and cattle ranching and so on and toward, uh, you know, actually using this great resource you have. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you just mentioned institutions because being such a new country in a way um, and with this history that I try to summarize here um, 
institutions are not, are not very strong here. And uh, some economical groups are very powerful. And you can always find uh, people from abroad, you know, uh, uh, foreigners with uh, interests that are not very good for Brazilians. But you do also find Brazilians that, you know, are not doing much for, uh, for their own country. And um, right now, what we have in the uh, as, as president, um, he and his group uh you know they are uh, uh, the, the the lobby for you know uh, soy and uh, uh, you said soybeans is that what you call yeah we, yeah I think you yeah you mentioned soybeans uh, yeah so uh, the amount of, of, of soybeans being planted in here is is just uh, it's just sad because the 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 the, the, the standing forest is, is so much richer and has so much capacity and potential and even economical potential, uh, not, not even mentioning what you're doing to the people and the biodiversity and the animals and the plants, even if, you, if you're interested only in economics, it is dumb uh, what they are doing. But these are, you know, powerful people, powerful interests. So we do have and we do find many, many people and ONGs and uh, even institutions trying to fight that and trying to come up with different ways to use the land and to um, come up with, uh, uh, you know, good uh, uh, projects uh, for the, co uh, the, 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 the country and the environment. But uh, right now we're just losing this battle like a big, big time. And, uh, and this uh, going back to to uh, Landis to Scott, uh, that first time when he was in Peru, he told me that uh, uh, the the current president of the, uh, for Peru, he was flying over the Amazon in the eighties, and he said something. Oh, this is the the the. Uh, we can save Peru and we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, get rid of starvation. We just need to uh, uh, farm this land uh, that they didn't, he, he didn't know it, it was very poor uh, land for farming. Yeah, <laughs> but the, that the, was that, that idea. The, and and his comment, like there's nothing, I'm sorry. You should fly over. There's just, there no, there's nothing there other than place to farm. And <laughs> it's, uh, you already have <laughs> Yeah, uh, th that notion. Uh, his comment was the uh, Scott's uh, comment was that uh, uh, humans do seem to have a, a serious uh, uh, learning disability. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, we so we do have people trying to do good things. Um, but right now, the, the government has just we have Ibama. Ibama in Brazil is the um, the institution that uh, takes care of the environment. Uh, one of them, uh, and uh, they are uh, responsible for, uh, um, you know, uh, um, doing control, you know, seeing if everything is going by the rules and, and that kind of thing. They have fired many of those, you know, the people that work for Obama doing that. Uh, we have INPI. INPI is, is the National Institute for the uh, uh, space, uh, space Engineer. I'm sorry for the translation. They have satellite images from, you know, everything that's going on. And we can see where there's deforestation. We can see where the fires are and how close they are, you know, uh, from uh, big, big properties. And uh, so some data came uh, and just, just to show how, um, you know, what kind of people were related to the fires we had in the Amazon and, and, and how uh, deforestation has, uh, has grown exponentially in a very, very short time. So the, the president for the, the IMPE, this the INPE, was fired just because he, he, he came to public to announce that data. So it's, it's just a very, very obscure times with a lot of setbacks, but um, we just keep trying to, yeah, uh, uh, resist. <laughs> gosh, gosh. Yeah, but full on, isn't it? Eh? Full on, full on. I think you have to be careful as well yourself, don't you? <laughs> what you're saying on, on the internet like this. Um, yeah. 
You too. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, Ian, uh, you've got your hand up. Did you want to ask a question, Ian? Uh, yes, I've no idea how you uh, go about asking questions. Uh, so I only discovered we, we put a um, there's a thing at the bottom called chat, and then you yeah. put in the chat. So uh, well, I I opened that and I couldn't put anything in it. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> nothing <laughs> happened <laughs> when I tried to write in it. So anyway, you've got me now. We've got you. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, could I just uh, ask about pronouncing your name, please? Is it you pronounce the th as a th sound? Is that Thiago? Is it? Uh, hi there. <laughs> could, hi. could be. Yeah, could be. Uh, but no, in Portuguese, the H is silent. Yeah, I thought so. so yeah. Uh, don't worry, Jeffrey. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, you, you, my Starbucks name in the US was Chicago. <laughs> 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 but that, that's because with my accent, you know, in this part of Brazil, the T-I would make a chi sound. Oh, right. So I would say right. Chiago. My Chiago, name. Right. right, right. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'd like to just make a comment. Uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, programs on British television recently about slavery. And one of the things that was said was that 50% of all the slaves across the Atlantic went to Brazil. And I was just staggered by that. I had no idea that you'd had such a massive influx of slaves. We did, yeah, we did. And I think we were uh, like one of the last countries in the world to abolish uh, uh, slavery. Right. Uh -huh. uh, it was a very, uh, it was a good business for Portugal. And then there was some uh, uh, international uh, pressure for Portugal to, uh, um, to stop with that, but then um, that went on uh, even after that law. I just uh, said that yeah. the, the, there was a law in 1888. Yeah. But if you look carefully, until today, we have working conditions that are analogous to slavery. You know, people living in uh, where they work, they're working uh, long, long, long hours. They're sometimes not getting paid, and there's, uh, you know, all sorts of sorts of violence is uh, yeah. going on. So it, it it is still a big issue, and uh, a lot of Africans do, uh, did uh, come to Brazil. You can sense that presence uh, in the, the way we uh, um, sometimes speak, relate to each other, the the, the stuff we uh, eat, uh, our music. So African presence in Brazil is, is huge. Yeah. I, I've got a wood question as well. About 40 years ago, I bought some timber, which in the UK at that time was marketed as piranha pine. And I understood it was from Brazil. I've no idea what the botanical name might have been, or even if it came from Brazil, or whether they just, but it was a, a light brown with a little bit of red in it. Quite a, a, a medium sort of hardwood, not a hardwood, it was meant to be a softwood, I think, but it was quite a, a, a nice wood. Uh, but I was told years later that it was no longer available because it had been, export had been banned. So I don't know if this name piranha pine means anything at all to you. What, what, what is it again? Piranha pine? Pira you know those fish in the Amazon that chew? Piranha, okay. <laughs> piranha pine. <Yeah. laughs> wow. I have some as well. Piranha pine. You do? Yeah, I'll get it. I never well. heard of it. That would be oh, that's so interesting. I love I love those those names because when when you when you study wood you can go for that there's the, the there's route you know the, the science and the botanical thing and I, and I yeah. I'm fascinated by that but the cultural side of it yeah. and the, well, you know the names and yeah I think it was just a trade name here a sales ploy of some sort and I just want yeah. final question if that's okay I'm interested in your plane making are you Putting two irons together, a cap iron and a, and the, 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 the blade, or, or are you just using a single blade? Sometimes I do. I do use a single one, just like this one, because a friend of mine is a, a, a 
blacksmith and he made this iron. So yes. this is a sing and iron plane. Sometimes I use these uh, uh, hawk uh, irons right. made in, in, uh, in California and yeah. they can come with a cap iron. So I'm using uh -huh. yeah, uh, yeah. both. Um, I do find that in use for Brazilian woods, um, they both can work fine. It depends on other aspects. So the angle, it would be one, and the uh, the width of the mouth would be another one for you know hard uh, timber yeah. that's too hard to plane. A, a very narrow opening would be, as you know, uh, very useful and uh, bringing or. You could either uh, 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 steep up the, the angle the, 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 the blade or just, you know, in the sharpening, I think the David Charlesworth uh, uh, showed this, you, you can, you can put like another bevel on the backside of the blade and you can raise the angle. So that, that works for me. So in my experience using Brazilian woods, um, both, you know, single iron or, or, or double iron, they, they work, they can work fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. I couldn't find my piranha pine. It, 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 it would take too long. Oh, but I did have one, I did have a I did have a piece. It's sort of a medium brown color, but it was very dense, like almost like a suradani. Yeah, well, I, I I I can show you that, Chester. I've got it here now. But uh, Ian, thank you very much for your questions, and and uh, Tiago, thank you very much for your answers. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Fitchett and Willacott. Um, Fitchett and Willacott look like this. Um, uh -huh. Basically, if you think about the um, the picture that I have on the uh, bench talk, um, is it, it, this box, and this is a box of samples of wood. Okay, um, nice. I'm actually, re really, really pleased to have this. Um, they're, they're quite rare; you, you don't see them often. But uh, this is the piranha pine that uh, that you're talking about. There, probably better to see it from this. Side. Okay, so I just googled it, uh, Jeffrey, and uh, what I what, what it came out is the araucaria, which is the uh, araucaria. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's the uh, the the. It's also known as Paraná pine. So perhaps piranha pine is a misnomer from Paraná. Paraná is a state, and you had and still have the, the, this. This tree is the symbol for that state, and 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 still have uh, some uh, trees still standing. Uh, but um, yeah, Paraná pine or piranha pine that would be the Araucaria. Uh, the botanical name is uh, Araucaria angustifolia. Wow. Uh, this means that the uh, the leaves are very narrow. No, I, I think Andy Tuckwell, are you handing, holding up a piece there, Andy? I'll put you on spotlight. Okay, yeah, very, very nice wood. I love it. Okay, um, so uh, next question up then, uh, Stephen, Stephen Prey. I've got uh, a Couple questions. Um, the in on our public broadcast shows, every once in a while we see uh, these stories about these factory ships like Toyota and Honda and so on going up the Amazon, and once they get into the one of the um, side branches that feed the Amazon, they just deforest. And are these, are these still going on to plant soybean? Is, is that what's going on with these kind of corporations? Yes, as far as I know, yes. Uh, um, the, um, what do you call it? It's like a highway, but in the river. Um, yes. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how you call it, but it, it, they are making another one. They're building this another one too, uh, because the, the, most of the soybeans are planted planted in the middle of Brazil, and one way to get this out is to go up. And if you go up, you you cross the Amazon, and you have a few rivers there, and you have. Uh, well, Anglo American is still in Brazil for like hundred hundred of years. They they have managed to turn entire mountains upside down. <laughs> so big like abyss, like uh, holes in the ground because of mining. And uh, uh, you have uh, also Anglo gold in the Rio Tapajós. The Tapajós River is one of those ways 
to get the soybeans uh, out of the country. That, that would be crossing, they are cultivated in uh, Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, which, which are, it's, it's like our Midwest. Uh, it, it, it is in the middle of the country. And if you go up, there's a state called Pará. And in, in Pará, you have that river and they're making a, a big, um, uh, what is it called, a harbor? Uh, you know, a place for the ships to, to go in and out. Right. Uh, so that th those, all those major, uh, um, uh, uh, um, all that major work is, has, has, has a severe uh, um, impact. And um, there has been a, like, a, a struggle, like, uh, you know, uh, can you do it? Do you have the papers to prove that this can be done without damaging the environment and the people leave it, living here? But then there's also like a fraud in, you know, in, that, in, in all of that. So it is uh, the typical turmoil you find in, in, in developing countries. Yeah, well, you were thinking of a canal. Because in, in the United States, Canal yeah. were, were waterways that were dug and then barge traffic would go up. And that was one of, before railroads occurred in mm. the United States, you were digging canals all over the place in the eastern part, northeastern part of the United States. And it was a way to get, get from river to river. Um, and it was a way of transporting goods um, cheaper than trying to get it overland if you had no road you know, over, you know, roadways. So it was waterways in the United States. So yeah, we, 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 we use those too. Um, okay. Before I retired, I was, uh, in fact, I'm still connected with um, National Academy of Sciences on climate change. And I was just wondering, um, have you noticed changes and shifts in rainfall uh, either the rain becoming more dense, more water when it falls, but less of it as far as the frequency of the storms, how it impacts the Amazon forest. Because back in the 1980s, we were given the statistic that for every square mile of rainforest eliminated in Brazil or in the northern part of South America, you get five square miles of desert forming in Africa. And it's very, very similar things are happening with Madagascar, where for every square mile there, you get 20 square miles of desert forming in Australia. And it's like where the water goes up and where the water comes down is, is really, really seriously affected by rainforests, which are one of the major ways of evaporating water and getting water vapor into the air so that it later comes down as rain. So just wondering, have you noticed um, weather changes in the la last five years for sure, but over say maybe the last 10 years in Brazil? I, I did, as a matter of fact, I did. Uh, we, we call it the, the, the aerial rivers. The, the, you know, the, the, because uh, uh, and, and, and there was a, 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 uh, something happened a few months ago because of the fires going on uh, in the Amazon. We had a, uh, a, a day here in Sao Paulo where uh, light was, it was completely dark. And that was because of, of the dust and the, uh, the, uh, the ashes from that fire, like thousands of miles from here. But you know, it got here. So that was a very clear message that it, it's all connected. And if you change too much of, you know, uh, one environment, it can affect uh, others. Uh, São Paulo used to be known as the uh, the the, the dr drizzle city. We had a very typical light drizzle going on here. That's non-existent. It doesn't it just doesn't happen anymore. So. Um, some of those uh, um, impacts are really noticeable. You, you, do, you do see it because uh, the rain pattern has changed or it is hotter sometimes. One of the reasons we, we have like many criminal fires going on in the country, but also the, some, uh, 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 some of those fires 
happened in places in Pantanal. I don't know if you ever heard of Pantanal. That's where the piranhas are. Pantanal is a biome near where the soybeans are, so south of uh, Mato Grosso and, and near Bolivia, Paraguay, and Argentina. So uh, in, in that area, uh, um, uh, people were, were trying to fight those fires and it was over 100, sometimes 110 degrees. And it is, it is very hot usually, but you know, not that hot with like two, three, four months without rain. So that, that has changed. I think it is, it is pretty, in spite of people denying it, I think it, it is pretty noticeable. Yeah, well this year, California, over 4 million acres of uh, land has been trashed and we had weeks where the sky, the sun was a deep, deep burgundy red because it, yeah. the smoke. And, and so, yes, we understand. And in California, our rains stop in April and do not show up. Well, we're now almost at the end of October and we've had yet to have a rainstorm in California. And so we're, we only get four or five months of rain and we're on the Western side of the United States. On the east, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, I grew up back there, and every seven to ten days, there'd be a rainstorm that go through. Uh, Mitch, your uh, typing just pulled you up. <laughs> anyway. No, but I hear you. Yeah, and that's appropriate because it's Mitch's question next. So, Mitch, off you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, thanks, Jago. Um, it was obviously a, a, a great talk. I missed some of it because I had to take a call in the middle, but I'll be watching the rest of it back uh, uh, later on when it's published. Uh, I saw behind you um, some templates for a guitar, and uh, I don't know if I missed it, but uh, do you have a guitar there you could show us that maybe you've made? Oh, God. Uh, not one I... No, I don't have any one I made. I, I have a... Uh, let, me, let me grab it. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. No, I don't have any finished guitars, but I do have this, which is a unfinished bass guitar model after a, uh, do you know Stanley Clark? Uh, I don't know, sorry. He's a, he's a bassist and he plays an alembic bass. And this was, uh, this is an alembic copy using, uh, this is the uh, Paul Marfim. Marfim is Portuguese for mar uh, mar Marfil. Marfil? Uh, mar Marfil? Uh, no, it's not Marfil. Oh my God. Draw a blank here. Sorry. So, uh, Paul Marfim, Purple Heart. This is Purple Heart. And this is uh, in Guia. And this is the Frejo. That's lovely. So, I have something like unfinished, but you know, this is, this is, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't have shown you this. <laughs> is that more of a, is that more of a passion rather than uh, uh, something financial? Yeah, it was because then when I, when I became a, uh, a woodworker and a, and a craftsman, then I, I, I gravitated toward the uh, historical keyboard instruments. And from there uh, I started, I started teaching and I still work uh, in organs from time to time, uh, especially when someone comes uh, to Brazil and needs some help. But uh, I haven't made guitars in, in, in quite a while. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Good, um, over to Derek. I think I've unmuted myself. Yeah. Jogo, hi, how are you doing? There he is. Hi, Derek. Long time, no, no see, no speak. Um, I had yes. a question about mahogany. You, you mentioned, I'm sorry to take the conversation back to Tim, as I thought we kind of veered off that subject now, but um, um, you, you said earlier on in your talk that um, mahogany as such was, was banned. You, you mean, it, it sounds bizarre to me that you don't have access to one of your sort of richest, historically richest resources. Is, is that still the case? I think so. I, I, I can find mahogany in the, 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 this one place 
and they say to me they do have the papers, but I, I'm not sure it was harvested now or if it's old stock. They don't tell me. And uh, that's, you, you know, uh, I'm, 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 Ivory, someone said Ivory. Sorry, Derek, sorry to interrupt you. I just said Marful, Marfim in Portuguese means Ivory. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. So uh, th th I'm, I'm very uh, uneasy with this because y you have someone saying to you uh, that they do have the papers and the you know the documentation to prove that um, they th that uh, wood is legal, but sometimes that is just not uh, um, true. Yeah, yeah. So, so what so, do you mean they have got papers that, that say it's legal? Does that mean it, it's stock that was that's been around for a long time? It hasn't been filled in sort of living memory. It, it sort of dates back a few decades. It could be, yeah. It could be old stock that was harvested like a, a long, long time ago, and someone someone might uh, uh, hidden it. It, it was right. hidden, and then and then you know now it resurfaced. Um, but uh, that's one very you know. It, it's tricky because you cannot always trust the official document saying that it is legal. Okay. So I can't I can find mahogany, but most people think it was uh, the, 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 the fact is it was prohibited. You couldn't cut down a mahogany tree. And now I think it is uh, just right now because it had some time to recover. Mm -hmm. It is all now. It's it's uh, you can cut again right. if you have the permit. Okay, uh, that is the legal information, the 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 the, uh, the official one. Uh, but uh, you know, in a day to day, if you go to the lumber yard, that's what you can uh, find. It can be legal or it can be like you know something odd. Okay. And so the other thing you and I need to talk about off, off, off screen, we, we've still got a, a deal to make, haven't we? We do, we do. We I'm do. so sorry, yeah, I, I yes, didn't draw you back. Let's do that in, in, in the comfort of our own Zoom chat, shall we, so we don't give too much away. It's okay, it's okay, yeah. Be delighted to, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, anyway, thanks very much, Tiago, and hopefully I'll, we'll um, uh, find an opportunity to meet in person again soon. Sure, yeah, I hope so. That'd be good. Okay, you take care, mate. And thank you, too. Uh, with, with a conversation like that, that means it's pretty public, and therefore it might benefit all of us with this deal. But we'll, we'll all we'll all, we'll all imagine about what that deal might be. But um, Thiago, that, that that's amazing. I mean, you know, to hear about the mahogany and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I, I'm in education as well, and and we can sort of date <clears throat> how old the uh, schools are by whether they were built with mahogany, whether they were built with teak or or with oak. So uh, you know, you can oh. really see that. So. The, the only stash that we can find for, for mahogany at the moment is uh, kind of old schools that are, are, are reconditioning their uh, science benches and their PE benches and things uh, because, you know, that, that all gets chucked out and then this new uh, engineered board comes in and, uh, you know, job, jobs are good. And, but uh, Thiago, sorry, Thiago. It doesn't <laughs> matter. Um, Thank you very much for a great talk. And, and I'd like everybody to, uh, to raise their bench beverages and to uh, say cheers to uh, to, to Thiago and to the bench. Thiago on the bench. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, it has been a really, really a pleasure to be uh, talking to you and then talking to you about uh, all things Brazil. And uh... It's a high tech conversation. And the low tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101.